Uh, before we dive into it and further progress on in Romans chapter 7 verses 13 to the end, uh, l- let me just review again where we're at and what we're, what we're doing. Uh, for those that may uh, not quite understand and need to hear it again, or uh, those that are new by way of internet, whatever it may be, uh, I always try to take a section of time in the beginning to review, sometimes longer than others. It all uh, depends. I don't really plan out it too much. But um, again, as we're dealing with the book of Romans, once you understand that God has two programs in his word, and the program in which we're involved in today in this dispensation of grace, uh, concerns the Apostle Paul. He was the, he's the apostle that God raised up to give the information to the Gentiles apart from uh, Israel through Israel's fall. Uh, you learn that there's a design in Paul's epistles. Even though they're not put in the order in which they're written, they're put in a doctrinal order. And therefore, Romans doctrine is the first doctrine, the first things, first issues that we need to come to understand. Uh, therefore, Romans 1 verse 1 is the first verse we're supposed to get, and then verse 2, then 3, all the way down through. And we are currently in Romans chapter 7, verses 13 through 25. And we dealt with, uh, obviously, the chapters beforehand. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 15 to 5, to the end of chapter 5, we were dealing with the issue of justification and its results. How is it that God has provided for us to be declared righteous in His sight? That's through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. And how that payment for the debt and penalty of our sins can be applied to us by faith and faith alone. And we dealt with all that, also how to function as an ambassador, how to share the gospel with others, and, and therefore how to discern where, where one that is unjustified is and lead them in the gospel of Christ to eventually the, the, the content, the good news of the gospel, that is, again, what Christ did for us on that cross, and that their response needs to be a positive one of faith and faith alone in order to receive the benefits of what was done on that cross. And we also dealt with in chapter 5 the much more assurance of our justification, of our salvation, that it's irrevocable, we can never lose it. Uh, No matter how many times we sin, whether we sin habitually or whether we we, uh, sin ignorantly, whatever it is, sin has been dealt with in regards to justification. Uh, It does not change our status of being justified unto eternal life. And that's what we covered in those, that section. And then we moved on, uh, as we saw in chapter 5, that God's grace is abundant. There's an abundance of grace. And the issue becomes in chapter 6 is having that grace to abound in our lives. And how we first learned that information in Romans chapter 6 was that God, by His grace, the moment when we believed, not only did He justify us unto eternal life, He also sanctified us unto functional life. In other words, he gave us a new identity. He he made some changes in us so that we could actually live unto him. We could actually bear fruit to his honor and glory, and that fruit be unto holiness. It's fruit that pleases him and that he delights in it. And that's the section we are still in. So that's where we're at, dealing with sanctification and its results. And those are the two things sitting in that spirit of holiness that he introduced there in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, that spirit of holiness, which is another way of describing the New Testament, uh, given uh, Jeremiah says that, that eventually a New Testament was going to come, a new covenant specifically to Israel, but the spiritual things in that New Testament that he shed for his blood for, those spiritual things have been given to us. And that's the first two things there, justification and sanctification, and we're still dealing with this second cornerstone. Now, in this section, it's broken up in these, we've broken up in these four parts, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 13, and then verses 14, all the way to chapter 7, verse 25, and then two sections in Romans 8, verses 1 through 13 and 14 through 39. We won't go through all that because uh, we're covering that, uh, but where we're at right now is the information which teaches us that the effectual working of our sanctified position in Christ requires that we be not under the law, but under grace. That's the main focus now in Romans chapter 6, verse 14, all the way to the end of chapter 7, is that who God's made us to be in Christ, it cannot work. It cannot function when you put, your, when you put it under the law, when you put yourself under the law. You have to function under God's grace, and that's what, everything that we're learning about. When we got to that section, we further broke it down even more. And uh, where we're at right now is we're dealing with the second misunderstanding uh, in regard to now be, uh, regarding 
now being not under the law but under grace and the corrective doctrine regarding it. We dealt with Paul's declaration there where he actually declares, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law but under grace. And then he deals with two objections, two erroneous objections there in chapter 6, uh, verse 16 through 23, and Romans 7, verses 1 through 6. And then the misunderstanding of the law that was behind these two objections we dealt with in Romans 7 verses 7 through 12 and now we're dealing with the final and the second and final misunderstanding here in verses 13 through 25 you break that down even further this is everything that we've already covered already um, but we're looking at the the issue that the law makes me functionally dead that's the misunderstanding Paul's going to say, God forbid, and he's going to teach us, he's going to give the corrective doctrine that we're functionally dead by nature. And so that's what we're dealing with in this section. You might be thinking, wow, we did all that already? Yeah, we did. <laughs> what, when, when, I, when, I look at the, when I look at the scriptures, I look at it from a, an aerial view, and then you just start focusing f further, further, further down in detail. And again, part of... Uh, my job, as Paul exhorts Timothy over there, he says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, exhortation, and doctrine. And the reading is everything that we're going through right now. The breakdown of the passage, obviously not only the reading, you actually read it, but also the breakdown of a passage to see the flow, to see the sense and sequence, to see the argument, to see how he's presenting the information. And that's what I try to provide for us uh, through this, uh, through these outlines and things like that. Well, what we covered last week is the breakdown of Romans 7 verses 13 through 25. Again, we're dealing with the second misunderstanding, which is there in verse 13, the first part of verse 13. If you glance your eyes there or up at the the uh, uh, projector, he says in his question, he says, "Was then that which is good made death unto me?" And that's that general statement that Paul gives, uh, and, and his pattern has been in regards to presenting the next section of information and to have us to understand what's behind what he's going to go on to say. And in the second half of verse 13 there, he's going to give the corrective doctrine. Look what he goes on to say there in the rest of verse 13. He says, God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. And then he gives a necessary statement that's going to set the stage for verses 15 through 23. And uh, we'll eventually cover that uh, in detail as we go through it. Let me see what my next slide is here. Yep. So as we move on now beyond the, the reading of it, and we start to deal with the, more of the exhortation of what this passage is designed to do, what Paul is dealing with, again, is the final misunderstanding regarding the law. We just got out of verses 7 through 12 where he comes along and says the law is not sin. There's nothing wrong with the law. The law and the commandment is holy, it's just, and good. And that's what his conclusion there when he gets to verse 12. But what he's also described is that the law provides an opportunity and with that opportunity, sin in us, sin in our members, takes occasion by that opportunity, takes that opportunity, takes occasion, and what it does, it deceives us, it slays us, it produces functional death, and we are aware of our sin in a, on an intimate, personal basis. That's what the law provides, and what it's what it's starting to what it started to show is that there's some activity to sin in our members already. And as we come out of that information in verse 13, that's what this question is based upon. He comes along and says in verse 13, he says, Was then that which is good made death unto me? And what we focused upon last time is, to start, we focused on one word in that sentence. And that's that word, made. He says, was then, and then is based upon the previous information, that which is good, which is, what is he talking about? That which is good. The law made death unto me. 
And this is, there's a lot of things going on with that question and other things that are latently involved in this section of information. But the overall gist of it, as far as just giving an exhortation of what this information is designed to do and what the, the, the question that Paul's bringing up, when something is made death unto you, that means that it wasn't that way in the first place. If something's made death unto you, then that's not what it was in the first place. And notice how he says, what was then that which is good made death unto me. And what's behind this question and what this question is teaching and what the misunderstanding is, is that it's not until the law comes into play, comes to my attention, or I put myself under it, that I become functionally dead. And that's partially true. Because what we just learned in verses 7 through 12 is that when you put yourself under the law, the law gives functional, it, it provides functional death. Meaning you put yourself under law and you're going to functionally die. Your fruit isn't going to be pleasing unto God. However, that's why we focused upon that one word made. The issue isn't we're fine and dandy before the law comes, and once the law comes, then we're in trouble. The reality is, because he's going to come along and say, God forbid, don't think that. The reality is, is we are functionally dead by nature. Meaning, by nature, we have no ability, we have no capacity, and we have no power in and of ourselves to bring forth fruit unto God. And what the law comes and does is it magnifies, it makes us, when we talked about that awareness personally and intimately, it makes it so that it cannot be missed. The law's job, another part of his job, and this is getting to the core root issue, verses 13 and 25 are, is that the law makes it so that you cannot miss who you are by nature. I want to show you this a little briefly in the context of justification, of, of kind of what he, how he dealt with this in the context of justification. Come back with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Again, the law makes it that we cannot miss, that we are functionally dead by nature. Not just not just a sinner by nature, but therefore what we produce from that nature is sin. It's functional death. It, it cannot be pleasing in God's sight. That's who we are by nature. That's, the, that's what Paul's getting at in chapter 7, verses 13 through 25. But look at this in the context of justification. When he brought the law into play, he really brought the law in in chapter 2. But look at it here in chapter 3. Look at verse 19. He says, now we know that what things soever the law saith. In fact, wait. Hold, hold, hold that. Come back to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And what Paul does, starting in verse, basically verse 18 there, is he explains that God's wrath is against man's unrighteousness and man's ungodliness. And he comes along and he lists that unrighteousness for us in verses 29 through 32. Look at it. He says, Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, and the list goes on. But he doesn't bring up the law yet. But also look at verse 32. He says, Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only are they going to die, but they're worthy of that death. He says that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Notice they know. They know the judgment of God in connection with their unrighteousness. And if you know the judgment of God in connection with your unrighteousness, you know what unrighteousness is. And you know that God doesn't look favorably, favorably upon it. But the law hasn't even come into play yet. 
But look at chapter 3 now. The law has come into play in chapter 2. And look at his final conclusion here in Romans chapter 3. Look at verse 19. He says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, but it doesn't stop there, not only to Israel who is under the law, but also subsequently, because they're under the law, everyone's under the law. Look what he says. That every mouth may be what? Stop. See, it's not only an issue of knowing unrighteousness and knowing that God doesn't look favorably upon it, it's the issue that when you try to excuse yourself of that unrighteousness before God, you can't. And you can't because the law, the law stops the mouth. And that's one of the functionalities in regards to justification that the law plays. And not only that, but look what he also goes on to say, and all the world may become what? Guilty before God. It stops the mouth in trying to provide an excuse of justifying your unrighteousness or trying to justify yourself. It stops the mouth. You cannot do it in regards to justification. And the law makes it that way. And it provides that and produces that guilt. Now, he goes on, verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, if it produces that guilt and it stops your mouth, then by the deeds of the law, you're not going to be able to justify yourself in his sight. And he says, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. You get that definition type awareness of sin there by the law. It stops the mouth. It produces that guilt before God. And what it's supposed to do is lead you of trying to just having God justify you instead of you trying to justify yourself that's one of the functions of the law now that same type concept regarding stopping the mouth that the law plays in the context of justification that's what the law is doing and what Paul's last final argument dealing with this misunderstanding in Romans 7 is designed to do it's designed, Romans 7, verses 13 through 25, are designed, and the terminology he's going to use is not stopping the mouth, but he's going to use the terminology, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The law, in regards to trying to utilize it to live unto God and bear fruit that he can accept, the, the, the end result of trying to do that is a wretched man concept. Not just stopping your mouth, but a wretched man because what the law is making evident and making you fully aware that there's no question in regard to who you are by nature is just that, that you're a sinner by nature. And the law is going to make that evident. And because it's the law, it's a fixed principle every single time you put yourself under it, that's what it's going to work. And the misunderstanding is that it's, when, oh, then when the law comes into play, so that's the misunderstanding. When the law comes into play, that's when I functionally die. But before the law comes into play, I'm good. I'm fine. It's made death unto me. When the reality is, one of the things that the law does is it makes you aware again that you're functionally dead already. You're functionally dead by nature. So that's what this passage in Romans 7 is designed to do. Well, let's get into it. Let's come back to chapter 7, verse 13. Does that make sense thus far? Before getting into the detail of it? All right. We're going to see that here. And the remainder of verse 13, but again, look at the question one more time. The, the misunderstanding, he says, Was then that which is good, that law, made death unto me? And he's going to say, God forbid, that's not what's going on. The law, doesn't, uh, the law doesn't change, nor does it change us. And he, he says, is it made death unto me? That death, again, is that functional death. And I just try to utilize that to, to, to uh, discriminate between the different kinds of death in the scriptures. There's physical death, there's eternal death, there's spiritual death, there's, this is functional death. And it doesn't come along and clarify, classify which 
kind of death is being talked about, but the context tells you that. We're not in the context of justification, so this death isn't losing your salvation. And that's going to become important when you get to chapter 8. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Most translations leave the next few words out, but they're supposed to be there. And they leave them out because they think that takes away, they think the remainder of the verse takes away from your security of your justification. Because he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, but he says, Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And if you're paying attention, I'm just talking about this hypothetical, we're, we're paying attention to it, but, but if you're paying attention, then you realize, just as the Apostle Paul himself, one that is justified and one that is sanctified, when he put himself back under law, he what? He died. He functionally died. And what Romans 8 is going to come along to, is going to take all this terminology that we've been using from Romans 6.14 to the end of chapter 7, and it's going to classify it as walking after the flesh. And he just got done stating when he himself, as a saved, justified, sanctified person, whose eternal security is just that, it's secure, when he put himself under the law, he, he, he realized, oh wretched man that I am. He realized what the law is supposed to do is show you who you are by nature. And that's the condemnation he's bringing up. And so if you walk after the flesh as a believer, putting yourself under the law, you're going to experience that same wretchedness as Paul did. And that's the condemnation. It's not a condemnation of losing your salvation because the context tells us different. The condemnation is a functional condemnation as a saved person that your fruit isn't going to be pleasing and what it's always what the law is going to make evident over and over and over again is who we are by nature it's the most inconsistent thing to what God's grace has done for us in Romans 6 Romans 6 verses 1 through 11 he's made us dead to sin and alive unto him the law is inconsistent with that because it makes us aware who we are by nature which is alive to sin and dead unto God and that's not who we are that's why he comes along and says I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord because the remedy has already taken place he's given us a new identity but that identifying the, the and classifying the different kinds of death is important because if we don't stay with the context then you're gonna end up the, the, what could end up taking place is thinking this death is losing your justification and this condemnation is losing your justification when there's a real condemnation as a believer that can be experienced if you put yourself under the law and that's one of the reasons that condemnation is going to stem to the judgment seat of Christ all believers are going to be there but if you are if you for your your, your lifetime have been putting yourself under the law trying to bring forth fruit unto God by that law, it's going to be burned up. It's going to be destroyed at the judgment seat of Christ. And in one sense, it's going to be condemned. You're not, because you're justified, but your fruit is going to be destroyed. Your fruit is going to be. And you're going to have nothing to bring before God to, that would please Him and, and delight Him. Well, look back at chapter 7, verse 13. So that's what that death is, was then that which is good made death unto me. And Paul says, God forbid, never think this. Don't think that way. And what he's going to begin to do now in the rest of verse 13 is he's going to start to give the corrective doctrine. The, the, the correct thinking to that misunderstanding that's stated in that question. And overall, what we're getting at here again was then that which is good made death unto me is I am functionally alive all well and good on my own and only when the law comes around I am functionally dead God forbid you, you, you're not quite there yet in your thinking because the reality is you're functionally dead by nature and so this is hitting this has like two gears to it the first one 
really is the issue of, it, it, it's a very, Paul, Paul is obviously stating the question and he's in, anticipating the misunderstanding. But this is, there, there's things going on here in regards to, to the, the root issue, again, not being the law, but it's being sin in our members. And with that law, sin in us, again, as the law provides opportunity, sin in us takes the occasion and it says, and it utilizes it to, to sin. But not only that, but what this question is kind of getting at is, is sin in our members coming along and saying, okay, do away with the law. You just told me the law, when the law comes into play, I functionally die. Well, do away with it and I'm okay. That's very crafty. Do away with it. It's the law's problem. Get away, take the law out, and we're okay. And hopefully you start to see that this has to come up. Because just as we kind of touched upon earlier in chapter 7 and verse 4, when he made us dead to the law, that he might establish this new living union relationship with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't just make us dead to the law and now we're on our own. We're going to live unto God and we're going to, I'm going to come along and dictate myself what I think is pleasing unto God and what's not. And, and, and I'm going to utilize my own power to restrain sin and to live righteously. But what he's done is he's established a new living union relationship. Therefore, our relationship, our newness of life that we have in Christ is not one of us just figuring it out on our own. But he's already done it for us. The issue becomes just walking after that. Learning it and, and walking after it and, and, and exercising it in the details of our lives. And the same true now with, with, with this question here in Romans 7 it, okay I'm fine do away with the law I'm fine I can I can figure it out I can restrain sin on my, on my own and I can live righteously unto God and that's the craftiness of what's resident within us remember God didn't eradicate sin out of our members it's still in our members the issue is God wants to display his grace being more powerful than what's in you it's the excellency of His power manifesting its, its supreme authority and power even though sin is in our members. That's the privilege we have in these bodies. Otherwise, He would have just took us out of the way right away. But He's manifesting His wisdom and His grace by us learning it and putting on display in these vessels even though sin's in our, in our members. And what sin is craftily coming along and having us think is that it's the law's problem. The problem is it with me. When I put myself in the law, it's made death unto me. God forbid. You're dead already. You're functionally dead already. And that's what this corrective doctrine is going to come along and, and teach. Now look at the rest of verse 13. After that, God forbid. But sin, notice how he always starts it that way. Look back up at verse um, 7, when we dealt with the first misunderstanding. He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known what? Sin, but by the law. Look at verse 8. What are those first two words? But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me. What wrought in him? Sin. Wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. Verse 9. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, what? Sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. But, or, or verse 11, for what? Sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived. What deceived him? Sin. What deceived him? Or what slew him? Sin. The law doesn't deceive. The law doesn't slay us. It's sin taken uh, by the commandment, utilizing that which is good against us. It's sin in us. The problem is sin in our members. And so he comes along again in verse 13. God forbid, but sin, 
that it might, what? Appear. appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. Semicolon, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly, I'm sorry, exceeding sinful. I'm going to talk about how it's not exceedingly. I just said exceedingly, but that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Now, there's two clauses in that sentence there after God forbid, and that's going to become very important. He says, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. And then you have a semicolon. A semicolon is one of the, the punctuation marks that is telling you to, to, to stop. A period, it's a hard stop. A colon is the second hardest stop. And then you have the semicolon and then the, and then the comma. But it's telling you to stop, make sure you got all the information. And it's also coming along and, and telling us that it's... it's it's distinct enough from the next group of information to, to have that pause, but yet it's still connected. And so there's two clauses here. He says, but sin, and then he says, after that, he says, that it might appear sin. And then after the semicolon, he says, that sin by the commandment. And so you have, but sin, let me write this down real quick. I think I have a slide, but let me just write it down. And again, you might be thinking, why are we taking so much time on this? But it's going to become important for us to handle the rest of the information. You have but sin. And then he says there, that. What does he say? That what? That it. And then the next one after the semicolon, he says that sin, right? So you have two that's. Two purpose clauses of the overall corrective doctrine. And again, those are important because he, in correcting the misunderstanding of the question, right, he's going to do it on two, in two manners. Two pieces of, of correction. And what he's going to do in the rest of the information, starting in verse 15, in verse 15, through 17, he's going to prove the, the first line of correction. And then in verse 18 through 23, I think I got that right. 18 through 20, yeah, there's 25. 18 through 23, he's going to prove the second line of corrective doctrine. And this also helps you to start understanding why he does the tongue twister. That I would, I do, that which I do, I don't know, and all the, uh, that which I allow, that I hate, and all this going back and forth, and why he, it seems like he's being redundant. And the reason is, because when he's correcting both, that has to be said in both. And as we understand edification, the second one is going to be intensified as it were the, the, the proof and the correct uh, the, the proving of the corrective doctrine to the misunderstanding it's going to be further intensified and we're going to be able to see this in this verse here in verse 13 okay so that's why it's important to see that there's two purpose clauses there's two that's and he's going to deal with this misunderstanding on two fronts and therefore, he's going to prove those two things in the remainder of the passage. Now look again here at verse 13. He says, But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. So he says... But sin that it might appear sin. The role that the law played in connection with our sin is not to make us sinners or make us functionally die or make us die. It was to make it appear that's what we were already. And we have to be careful and look going back historically and looking at this. But let's 
let's look at it historically and let's look at you can see a, 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 a smidgen of, of that issue back in Romans 5. Look at Romans 5. We had to deal with Romans 5 when we talked about the much more assurance of our justification unto eternal life. And the third aspect of how God does that is by letting, uh, teaching us about the atonement, the atonement that we have received. And in talking about the at one mint, you, you, he goes back and talks about the one man Adam and the one man Christ and the similarity that they had and also the difference. And out of that difference between Adam and Christ comes, and, and what they did in their one man status, Adam won sin and brought sin and death into the world. And Christ doesn't take on one sin, he takes on many offenses and therefore our justification is that much more sure. And when he, come, when he dealt with that issue, out of that difference comes our eternal security. But in that information, he brought up the law and a time before the law came into play. Look at verse 12. He says, wherefore, as by one man, and that's a, that's a specific status, that it's a one man status. Not everyone can come along and claim a one man status. There's only two men that have a one man status. That's Adam and Christ. And we talked about that when we went through it. If you want to go through it, again, we have all the lessons up here and on the, the, the website and on YouTube. You can go back and deal with Romans chapter 5, verse 11 through 21, and we talked about that. But look what he says. He says, Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death, that's, that's, that's spiritual and physical death. And death by sin. But the next statement is, is coming along and teaching us about the, the uniqueness of holding a one man status. Look what he says. So he says, sin entered into the world by one man and death by sin. And, sin, and then he says, and so... And you have an as so, as it took place with one man, he says, so death passed upon what? All men. So what Adam did in his one man status gets applied to all men. Even before they're born. Even before Adam and Eve have Cain and Abel, sin has passed it to all men. What, what Adam was going to get done in his one man status was going to get passed upon all men. And you think of that at first, and you think, man, that might not be very smart. But when you really think about it, and think about it from God's perspective, it's absolutely genius. Because when the problem came, sin and death, in order for God to deal with it, he needed to deal with it in a all-encompassing way, as it were. In other words, he wasn't going to have, this is silly to say, but just to get the point, he's not going to have a, a million billion Christs dying for a million billion quadrillion sins. He's going to have one man, his son, die for all men and all their sins. And so in putting Adam in a one-man position, one-man status, remember, because he goes on to say there in verse 14 at the end, who is a figure of him that is to come. He's a figure because that's what he's going to do with Christ. And thank God he did that because if he didn't, then you and I wouldn't have ever been saved. But the, God has the ability and the legality to take what the one man did and have it apply to us and God set it up that way in his absolute wisdom and genius but so the point there in verse 12 is sin entered the world by Adam and death by sin and so death passed upon all men for that all of sin but what he's got to do again because he's setting up that this can take place with the Christ when he comes and what he does and so he's got to prove that one man's status and that what takes place with that one man gets applied to all men. And how he proves that 
is by a time period between Adam and Moses when the law wasn't in play. Because if the law is not in play, and the law is the knowledge of sin, and the law is an imputer of sin, and men are still dying, then that's proving that they're sinners. And thus proving that what took place with Adam got passed to all men before the law ever comes into play. And so that's what he goes on to say in verse 13. He says, for until he gives a big parenthesis here from verse 13 to 17. And he says, for until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned. We talked about all that. My tendency is to go into that, but that's not our focus right now. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even before the law came into play. And, and, did, and, and provided that guiltiness. And it provided to stop every mouth. What was going on is men were sinning. And therefore men were dying. In fact, if men are dying, you know that that sin got passed upon all men. And therefore what took place with Adam got passed upon all men. And he goes on to say, verse 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Even though they didn't do the specific sin that Adam sinned, that sin still got passed upon them. And they died. Men were dying. It, I mean, it took a lot longer at that point. But they still died. And therefore, they're sinners by nature. It got passed upon. And therefore, it got passed upon us. But because of what Christ did, now that gets passed upon us. And what we get in Christ is far greater and much more greater than what got passed upon us from Adam. He says, who, who is the figure of him that was to come? And so I bring all that up to describe that to, to show us historically that the problem wasn't the law. We had the problem before the law. We had the problem when Adam produced it. When Adam sinned in his one man status, it got passed upon all of us. And therefore, it's not like historically, hey, there was no problem between Adam and Moses, and then when Moses gave the law, there's the problem. No, the problem took place with Adam. And that's what's being proven here. And that's what's also being proven, not in a historical sense in Romans 7, but in a practical sense in Romans 7. That when we, that we by nature, if God, if, if we didn't learn Romans 6, 1 through 11 yet. If we by nature, in our own ability, in our own capacity, in our own power, try to live unto God, it cannot take place. Nor when, if we grab a hold of that law to try to control our sin and restrain it and try to have a means to motivate us to do good, nor will it get done because that's not the law's function. The law's function is what he's going to go on to say. So historically you can see that the problem isn't with the law. The problem is what man was before the law the law is going to come along and it's going to make that evident to man. And the same true in the sense practically for us. That if God, again, if we didn't learn Romans 6, 1 through 11, because I got to say that because he's going to come along and say, I thank God through, our, through his son, the Lord, through the Lord Jesus, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Because the thankfulness, the remedy, he's already taught to us. But if he didn't tell us Romans 6, 1 through 11, and he comes along and says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under law, but under grace. And then all the objections and misunderstandings come. And then the, the, the person comes along and says, okay, yeah, do away with the law, because when the law comes, it's made death unto me. Before the law, before, or uh, when that law, when I put myself under it, then I functionally die. Paul's going to come along and say, nope. In and of yourself, you have no power, no capacity to do it. And it it's, it's getting to the core of who we are by nature. And 
it, it's kind of like a double blow because you get it in justification, you cannot justify yourself. And it's proven by the law. If you could justify yourself, the way in which you could justify yourself is trying to keep the deeds of the law, and you can't do it, therefore you cannot justify yourself. And if you get a blow there, and then in sanctification, we get the blow. As far as trying to please God and live unto Him in the details of our life, we cannot do it by ourselves. And if we could do it by ourselves, it would be by that law. Because this law is holy, righteous, good, just and, just and good. We would do it by that law. But what the law comes along and does is shows us we can't do it. And it shows us who we are by nature. And what that's doing, what that's doing is leaving the only remedy for us. God has to do it. He had to do it in justification, and he's got to do it in sanctification. In fact, we've already learned that he did do it in sanctification. The problem is, one that is justified and sanctified coming along and saying, kind of leaving what he taught you in Romans 6, 1 through 11, your new identity in Christ, and coming along and saying, I can do this. I can do it by that law. And Paul's dealing with all those objections, all that misunderstanding, so that, as I said before, and I'll say it again, you stay away from that law. Not because it's the law's problem, but because of who you are. And even though he's given us a new identity, we still have sin in our members. And that law only and ever will call upon who you are by nature. It will call upon your flesh. When you talk again about the law, that's the fixed principle. Time and time again, just as gravity, you go up on a building and 10 times out of 10, unless you have another law, unless you have wings, or unless you have a well, even if you have a parachute, you're going to come down. But you have something to get you up. You have jets on an airplane or something like that. Ten times out of ten, you're going to come down. And ten times out of ten times, when you put yourself under the law, it's going to show who you are by nature. That's its job. It's righteous. It's holy. It's good. But it does something in connection with us. Now look at chapter 7 again. Look at Romans chapter 7, look at verse 13, after the God forbid. That's why he says, but sin. He doesn't say, but the law. He says, but sin, that it might appear sin. Now, that issue of might, sometimes might can be used, maybe, maybe not. This might is a might of intent and purpose. It's the issue of, I did this so that this other thing might happen. You, you, you purposely did something so a result would occur. And it's going to occur. It's not a, I'm going to do this, but maybe it will occur. I don't know. You know that when you do something, this result's going to occur. That's this might. He says, but sin, that it might appear sin. So the law always, it's, a, it's, it's that might of intent and purpose, the law is always going to make sin appear sin. And that, that tells you something that we, without the law, if you look back historically again, if the law never came into play, man wouldn't have understood sin the way in which they need to understand it. And especially what it is in God's sight. That they would recognize that there was a problem and that they need a solution. That they're in a predicament and that they need redemption. The law is what provides that. It doesn't provide sin. sin. Sin's there. What it does is it makes sin appear sin. Now there's genius in using that word appear. And again, many translations just take away from the passage by changing the words, thinking the King James translators were stupid when they were smarter than them themselves. They weren't holy men, but they were men who understood language. That's what you're looking for when you're translating. Men who understood the language that they were translating from and into. And 
the problem today is not many people don't understand the, the language they're translating from, the Greek and Hebrew. The problem is they don't understand the language they're translating into English. Because our English language has completely been dumbed down. But appear is a very specific word. Now, fundamentally, as you just go look up in a dictionary, it's to bring forth into light, to become evident, to come or be in sight, to be in view, to be visible. But there's also some other words that are very closely related, some synonyms. Shown and recognize. Those are, those are two. But there's a difference between shown and recognized compared to appear. Let me just read this to you. And, uh, this comes from old English grammarians and old English synonym books back from the 1800s that teach and discriminate between words to show you, that's how, that's how the English language was utilized back in that day. A word meant something. And, a, and a, a specific word meant something in a specific context. And they use the word appear here because of the specific context and because of what the word di dictates for us. The difference between the words shown, recognize, and appear. Shown in a form of seeing something, and it has to do with something being seen or displayed. And recognize has to do with coming to know something that has been perceived before. Appear is not like that. But shown and recognized can be used in dealing with issues that are, granted, brought to light. But both of these terms ha can have some degree of vagueness to them. And this context that we're dealing with right now demands that there be no degree of vagueness at all. It is conceivable that you should see something or be shown something and even to recognize something but only see and recognize it vaguely. But, when we, don't, but we don't use the word appear like that. And the discriminating difference between appear and these other words tells you why. Appear, along with the other words, all have in common, this is what they do have in common, the idea of something coming to light or coming into view. But the discriminating difference or shade of meaning that causes you to use them in different contexts has to do with the degree of clarity or degree of vagueness expressed in the context. Um, you can come along and say, I'm trying to think of an example, but not very good at examples off the top of my head. You could come along and say, uh, The, the stars, I recognize the stars at night or are or, or shown the stars at night, but that doesn't quite meet the criteria. Because when you see stars at night, it's really not vague. It's, it, it, we don't, it, they're not vague, it, they're, they're clearly seen. And we say the, the stars appear, the, they're, uh, they appear at night or the moon appears at night. Appear comes along and says there's no vagueness to the issue. Where shown and recognize, you can come along and say, utilize shown and recognize in a, in a very vague way, a very unclear way. But appear, there's none of that. And that's the context that we're in. What he's trying to come along and teach and correct is that the law's function, the law's not sin, the law's not made death unto me, what he's trying to show is ha the law. What the law shows, and what it does is it makes sin appear sin. There's no vagueness. There's no lack of clarity. The law is the means by which sin appears sin. And that's why I tried to describe before in, in mechanical form. When that law comes and says, "Thou shalt not covet." It's not, it, it, it's, it doesn't give any further information of how you don't do that or what you're supposed to alternatively do. And when it says, thou shall not covet, you don't covet. It's calling upon you. And all we have by nature to not do that is sin itself. And so what that commandment is doing and the law is doing 
is it's calling upon sin to not sin, therefore making sin appear sin. That's the law's function. That's the law's role. And that's what he's bringing out here. But sin, that it might appear sin. We have to come to the reality, not only before we're saved, but even after we're saved, that we by nature are functionally dead. In fact, we've already come to that to some degree because if that wasn't the case, then God wouldn't have had to make us dead to sin and alive unto God. But this is bringing it full circle and it's making it that we're aware that in and of ourselves and therefore when we grab the law that calls upon ourselves, we can't do it. We can't live unto God. Yet you also have to understand because of the alternative, the greater alternative, the one that's going to get the job done, His grace. Just because in and of ourselves we can't get it done doesn't mean that God's grace isn't going to produce something that when we take His grace in the form in which He's going to give it, when we learn it and utilize it and it becomes in us and out of that we do things that we can't produce fruit unto holiness because that's not true either. When we learn about His grace and the mechanics of His grace and we utilize them we're going to be able to not only discern whether we're walking after the flesh or after the spirit under, his, under the law or under grace, but we're also going to therefore know whether we're functionally dead or functionally alive. Whether the fruit that we're bearing is unto death or the fruit that we're bearing is unto holiness and the end of everlasting life. But the first part we have to understand is we don't go to that law because every single time we grab hold on to that law. We are doing it in our own strength, in our own capacity. And what it's actually going to teach us is that we're weak to restrain sin and control sin. Look what he goes on to say here. But sin that it might appear sin. Notice what he goes on. Working death in me by that which is good. It's that similar type issue, just in a slightly different context as what we were dealing with before. Working death in me. What's working death in him? Sin. <laughs> sin. Sin is, sin is working, but it's working by something. Working death in me by that which is good. But... It's, it's, it's the issue it's the issue of not, not making you that way you're already that way it's, it's the issue of just what he said, appear it's, it's like coming along it's like having like an ant and an ant is, is crawling on the ground but you might not even see it but if you put a magnifying glass on that thing, it's a it's an ant, and it's, it's working. That's, that's the law, in maybe in a, in a simple way of describing it. The law is a magnifying glass of what's already there already. And so what it does is it does give it functional life, but that doesn't mean if it wasn't there, we weren't functionally dead or we weren't, or we weren't sinning in the first place. It makes, it gives sin functional life to show that who we are by nature. That's the law's role. So again, working death in me by that which is good. Now look at the second part here. We'll just begin to introduce this and pick it up next lesson. He says that. So here's another purpose clause of dealing with the misunderstanding. Maybe I should ask, is there any questions of that thus far? The issue, this, this is important, that's why you might have noticed the last few lessons I've been kind of breaking and asking if there's any questions because it's really simple and I feel like I have a tendency to complicate some things and trying to describe the details of it and I don't want to, I want to make sure I'm not doing that. So is, is there any question regarding to the first clause there, but sin, that it might appear sin, 
working death in me by that which is good. You understand that sin works death in you already, right? Sin exists in you already, right? And that you're functionally dead by nature. But the law comes and it does work death in you, but not for the very first time, as it were. It does it, it increases it to make it appear to you. So that there's no question again that that's what's going on within us and that's who we are by nature. That makes sense? All right. Second clause, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. We got some similarity there. It starts out by saying that, and then the issue of that sin, just like before he said, but sin. We have the similarity of by the commandment to that of that which is good. You have that same word might in there. And then you have the issue of become exceeding sinful. Notice he doesn't come along and say that sin by the commandment might become a sinner. How he describes it, he says that he might become exceeding sinful. That's the issue of you're, you're a sinner already. The law is going to come along and make you exceeding sinful. So there's no question that you're a sinner by nature. Now... Let me, um, let me just wrap this up here for this lesson. This issue of exceeding, this is another word that's changed in many translations. It's not the issue of beyond measure, even though there's, a, there's, there's an aspect that, of that to that. It's not the issue of utterly, that's one of the words used, or exceedingly. It's exceeding. We don't use this word like this much today, but it's the issue of exceeding. And the issue of exceeding, basically, I'll just put it this way, I'll just sum this up. When we try to take that law it's a, it, it, it's, it's a further advancement to what he's dealing with when we try to take that law and utilize it and therefore utilize our own ability our own strength our own capacity of what we have by nature and especially with that law what sin is going to do is sin is always going to exceed our efforts. Every single time. When we, again, by our own power, our own capacity, whether it be with the law or without the law, try to control sin and live on the God, sin in our members will always exceed our efforts. The best of efforts, the most sincere of efforts, it will always exceed it. And not only will we, be, not only will we recognize we're sinners by nature, but we'll recognize we're full of it. We're full of sin. We are sinful. To make it appear again, but to show that exceedingness capacity so that, again, without a question, we know who we are by nature. And that's that second component. We'll talk about that more next lesson. And that's going to lead into him. He has, to do, he has to set up some things with verse 14. And then he's going to start to prove these two clauses. And he's going to utilize himself. So there's some authority behind all this. Not only that it's God's word, but it's utilizing the Apostle Paul himself to get us to the point to where we left off. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 13, before he came along and says, For sin shall not have dominion over you if you're not under the law but under grace, of coming along and understanding that the only way in which we can live unto God is if he did something for us. If he delivered us from the body of this death, that by our own capacity, by our own power, our best efforts, sin will always exceed that he had to do something. And that's exactly what we have in our new identity. We're dead to sin. 
and alive unto God. That's where he's headed towards. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to again look into detail regarding the law's function. The, la the problem again isn't with the law. It lacks in regards to trying to change us or reform us or redeem us. It cannot do those things. However, the root problem, the main issue is us, who we are by nature. The problem with, was in justification of who we are by nature and the same is true in sanctification, who we are by nature. And therefore, not only do we have to rely upon your grace in order to be justified unto eternal life, but at the same time, we relied upon your grace in sanctification. It took place the moment we believed. You actually packaged it together. But now as we desire to walk in this new identity, may we not be so foolish because of the objections that Paul dealt with and the misunderstandings of the law that Paul's dealt with and we haven't, we're not done dealing with it. But we, may we not be so foolish to try to put ourselves back under the law to live pleasing unto you. Because if we couldn't do it in the first place, we're not going to be able to do it now that we are sanctified unto eternal life. In fact, our sancti uh, I'm sorry, sanctified unto functional life. In fact, our sanctified new identity in Christ is the issue of delivering us from sin's activity in our, in our members and the law's strength that it gives sin. Our new identity delivers us from sin functioning in our body and in our life. We thank you that's already taken place. And then again as we go forth, that we wouldn't touch that law because it's the most inconsistent thing with who you made us to be in Christ. Because it manifests who we are by nature instead of who you've made us to be in Christ by your grace. And therefore as we walk, may we not walk under it but under your grace. Knowing that that's what's ahead especially in Romans chapter 8, how it is that we walk under your grace, or as Paul's going to come along and teach it, walking after the Spirit. So Father, we thank you for all this information that's designed to work effectually in us, so that we would realize we're not under the law, we're under grace, that we wouldn't touch it, and that we wouldn't walk, therefore, under it, but that we would grab hold of the greatest power in the universe, the greatest power that you, that's at your disposal, your grace, and that by it, we would have it work effectually in us and produce the fruit and the holiness and the end of that being everlasting life that you have designed it to be and that we would further be conformed to the image of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ and take upon us the privilege of being your sons and daughters for a grand purpose in the heavenly places. May we take that up and not the law and not the religious treadmill, and not the religious, the, 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 the cyclical flesh process that we may have experienced or that we could experience, and not experience that wretchedness, and not experience that condemnation, but experience and be thankful for your grace. If I do pray if someone's here listening, they have not trusted Christ, how they died for their sins, was buried and rose again. And they believe this very moment, knowing that you, your wrath is against them because of their unrighteousness and the only way that they can escape that is by benefiting from the complete payment that Christ made on the cross and that you're extending that complete payment as a gift to them and the way in which they receive it is by faith and faith alone. May they believe this very moment and the moment they do, they'll be justified unto eternal life. All their sins will be forgiven past, present, future. Your righteousness will be imputed unto them and they'll possess the gift of eternal life. We also thank you for this time of grace giving. Don't give grudgingly or out of necessity. We obviously, or at least hopefully it's obviously, don't give as those that gave under the law, the tithe system of the law. We give, all right, as Paul teaches us, but we give in connection with your grace and your word working in us in response to all these things that you've done for us. That's how we give. So that they would not only, the, the, the preaching and the teaching and the spiritual things in your word not only will benefit us individually, but benefit the whole body as well as those outside these walls. Those are the reasons and the motivation behind grace giving today. We don't do it grudgingly or on necessity, but willfully and cheerfully, for you love a cheerful giver.
and according as every man purpose in his heart. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.